Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. So glad you're here today for a great interview. It's kind of a an interview second dissident dispatch a little bit, but I, I think it's going to be great. If you're interested in learning about ethnic studies, this is the place. Um, if you're new to the channel and you're interested in being part of the solution to our education crisis, I hope you will subscribe to be notified when I make new content. Please also like and share this broadcast. We are live. So if you're joining us live, you can join in in the comments and ask questions. If you're watching on the replay, thank you for being here. Please also like, share, subscribe, and all the good things. Um, I want to make sure that every person, not just parent, every person in America gets to see this because our tax dollars are paying for it. Uh, America's children are being taught these ideas, and it is very, very important that you know what is going on. Um, each of these shows is an opportunity to hear from people who are working to improve education in America any way they can. And this is no exception. Ms. Marcel Carab is a mother, wife, and local advocate representing multiple parent groups. She also speaks out regularly on her podcast, Be Not Afraid. And I have been privileged enough to appear on that show a couple of times. So go check it out. Um, as a former foster child who agreed to, or sorry, and I agreed, who aged out of care and does not subscribe to the victim narrative, Carib finds herself in the center of this cultural battle. She works tirelessly to defend the virtues of meritocracy. She is an advocate for all children and believes that the best solutions come when ideas are brought to the table with both reason and compassion. And I uh, hope to be able to consider her my friend as well. I think I have infinite respect for her. I love the work that she does. And I'm so grateful to her for agreeing to bring this content to us today. So please join me in welcoming Cara Michelle Marcel. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. And yes, I do consider you a friend. Okay. You know, I never want to say she's my friend. And it's right. like, wait a minute. I never said that. I'm kidding. Right. <laughs> um, I don't want to be presumptuous. Okay. So um, where do we begin? I, really quick. I just want the people tuning in today to know that I sort of covered a piece of this last Monday when I talked about the president, the university presidents, and I talked about the latest ethnic studies curriculum to drop. I went through sort of one of the units, right? And I went through the material they put out on their website page by page, but you have the whole book, right? I do. So that's big. Um, and you made some observations about it, did you not? What did you observe? Well, the first thing that was really shocking is that the book was created here in Utah. So this is the family-friendly state. This is the state where people move because they're seeking refuge, because they believe that none of the garbage is coming here. And our state, a company in our state, produces it. So I think that is, that's the first thing that I learned that was pretty shocking. Secondly... I mean, maybe you can't tell because of the lighting, but I'm a person of color <laughs> and, um, and, um, I am not against history being taught. What I always say is teach the bad, teach the ugly, but also teach the beautiful. And right. when I started going through this, I realized the beautiful is missing. The beautiful is right. completely missing in this. So, yeah. Now. When you say the beautiful, can you define that for people? Because I want to make sure we're all on the same page in what we're talking about. Sure. I think when most people think of ethnic studies, they think that we are discussing cultures, that we are celebrating culture and, and excellence and achievements. And if that's what the book was, I would not be on this show. I would not be spending hours and hours going through model policies but that's not what it is and that's not what ethnic studies is ethnic studies has a much more nefarious um aim towards it and so right. yeah and i you know we've we've spoken about this nefarious aim quite a bit i've spoken about it on the channel and i you and i have talked offline um we we kind of observed and that's how we made the title of the show that what is noticeably missing when you talk about the beautiful is 
the message that we might put under the, you know, we might put under Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy of cooperation, um, you know, aspiration, reconciliation. There's a whole lot of words that would go that in would there. That would be seen for our merit, not the color of our skin. Right. right, exactly. You know, that my my young son will be, you know, judged by the content of his character, not by the color of his skin. And that we would all sort of join hands together as right. one nation. And that we would finally, as a nation, live up to the, you know, the founding documents, live up to it. And if we hadn't lived up to it yet, that that was our aspiration. We live up to the idea of, you know, equal, you know, politically equal. Right. Right. And in a sense that, you know, while we may not literally be equal in our circumstances, we would have all the same rights. We would be treated equally under the law um, and not just under the law, but in terms of how our our government, how our municipalities, how our you know, how we're treated in any kind of official capacity. But I don't recall Martin Luther King ever saying, please legislate and force private citizens to interact with me, like me, et cetera. It was more like, you know, don't make rules arbitrarily forcing people to not interact with me because that's what Jim Crow was, right? Right. But there's even more yeah. than that. Um, at the end of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, after the part that everybody knows, he addresses the African-Americans. And he says very clearly that... Things aren't going to get better overnight, and we must rise above. We must be the kind people. We must show them with our character that we are deserving of these things. Now, some people will say, well, I shouldn't have to, but that's the human condition. <laughs> human beings. And back then, you know, I'm so grateful for what they, what they did and that I didn't have to live under the same circumstances that they did. We're yeah. removing the gratitude. We're removing their stories we're removing their work so we can quote unquote do this work, which is right. ripping our country to shreds. And there's a difference, isn't there, between sort of a, a pick me mindset of pretty, pretty, please be decent to me. And, you know, when we are in a situation where we are, we have to interact, like I said, with the state or so forth, you, 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 you have to be, you can't, you shouldn't be permitted to trample on me and trample on my rights to speak of right. him. But I'm going to demonstrate to those of you who've been miseducated, who've been, you know, brought up a certain way that they were wrong. And I'm, you know, I'm going to live my life in such a way that you're going to eventually pretty quickly, in fact, feel foolish for discriminating against me, miss out on economic opportunities if you discriminate against me. And isn't that sort of how things went when they were allowed to organically progress that people pretty quickly realized I'm missing out on business. I'm missing out on all kinds of opportunities because I have these weird arbitrary biases and, and uh, race prejudice. Um, and that ironically, when government gets involved and says you must, that actually gets slowed down. Right. Because now people don't like to feel forced to do things. It's weird. People, like you said, the human condition, people don't like to be pushed and forced. Um, but you know, when I start losing money because, you know, everybody's going to the shop that happily sells to black and white alike. They're not coming to my store anymore. Uh oh. Right. So that's missing that, that, that we, we will overcome and we're going to make our own businesses. We're going to start, we're going to be our own, whatever. Um, and so with that in mind, we came up with, we looked at the book that you have and found that there, there was something to tell people about what it actually is. There's material to show them about how they're presenting opinions as facts. Like a lot. Right. right? <laughs> the whole book. It's very unbalanced in the sense that the opinions that they're presenting as facts are all one very specific worldview of communism. And, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and the whole thing is oriented to what? What do they want our kids to become? Activists. Exactly. Marxist oh, activists. We, exactly. But we bring the receipts, don't we? We don't do. We care. Okay. So yeah, we don't we don't just throw things out at you and say, this is so, believe us. Um, so we're going to show you. Uh, first, we have the part that says, this is what it actually is. 
And this is the table of contents of this book, right? Now, what is the program called? It's called Voices, an Ethnic Studies Survey. So I think- Why is it called a survey? I think survey is really important because what it does is on almost every page, definitely within every chapter, it tells the kids to look up their sources, no other sources, just their sources, and then write kind of how that needle has moved, which is, it's basically a struggle session for 11th and 12th graders. So, so they're checking in with them constantly to see how their attitudes have changed or whether they have internalized and incorporated. I mean, it starts um, off in the very beginning with that. We all have biases. Can you describe what whiteness means? And then it has, you know, Ibram X. Kendi, and you covered who, who was in those first pages. Um, right. and, and there are many of us, people of color and not, who find mm -hmm. Ibram X. Kendi's views controversial, to say the least. Um, there's a lot of those kind of voices where you're like, well, there's a whole other narrative to that. Are we not going to listen to that? And the answer is no. No, they're not going to listen right. to that. They're going to present these things as truth and anything else is misinformation. Well, even just glancing at these, at the table of contents and the unit names and what's beneath each unit, you know, what I see are a lot of terms that on their own could be debated. So we're talking about 11th and 12th graders now, right? So we're talking about 16 and 17 year olds roughly. And you've got a whole unit, which is the first unit devoted, which I find interesting, devoted to understanding race and ethnicity. That saying, we're about to tell you what race and ethnicity are by our definition. And when you know our definition, you will understand it. Yeah. So it's not debating it. It's not covering it as, as kind of a, a subject about which people disagree. Would it be safe to say that people do all over the world, not just in America, disagree about what race and ethnicity are and mean? Absolutely. So it seems somewhat strange to me that they would have a, first of all, open up with the first unit of we're going to talk about what it is and then intersectionality, you know, right out of the gate, which right. is a theory hotly contested. Um, well, it at also, least in so far as, sorry, go ahead. Well, it also goes into um, how belief in God is pseudoscience, which you can agree with or you cannot agree with, but to bring that into school seems like a violation of church and state. Well, especially when you consider that they're covering gender theory as if it's science. Right. So if we're going to be start calling things pseudoscience, I, you know, religion never professed to be science, just for right. the record, <laughs> but gender theory does. Um, when intersectionality, in addition to being a hotly debated topic, it's, debated itself across lots of intersections of disciplines in the sense that, you know, we might look at a legal case, like what spawned it, a legal case where women are suing GM and say, you know, here I, I, I kind of see why Kimberly Crenshaw said you have to look at these women and their situation with GM a little differently, that they are both female and black. And so you're not really looking at the discrimination. You know, I can look at it and I can stand back and, you know, check my biases at the door against the whole theory and say, well, you know, right. that actually makes a little sense, right? But where they lose me, and I don't know how you feel, is when we start taking it as truth in all situations from the word go. Like we start at zero and we can check boxes where these intersections are and we can know things based on that and we can judge other people's behavior towards us based on that and i that's where i'm like no no time out time right out. yes There's putting so us in boxes or, or calling us a monolith which is hugely they just assume that we all agree with these things and it's really weird normally i'm pretty relaxed but i'm very tense because i've spent the last two days browsing through this stuff and and reading it and seeing how hopeless and discouraging it is and how you know african americans who believe kind of the way that i believe things like booker t washington is called an accommodationist 
um, anybody who doesn't agree with what they what they want, what they expect the kids to be able to just regurgitate is no longer worth anything. We're erased by this curriculum that is telling every single child and they're going to make our children learn this. Right. And, and, and it's, it's right there in unit one. That's what I yes. covered in the other video was unit one where they lay out some pretty heavy concepts some concepts yeah. that deserve a lot of debate. They deserve to be presented neutrally and to show, you know, different sides of what it is. That could take a whole year. You could spend an entire year just focusing on understanding rights and ethnicity as topics. But they go right into, and, you know, we conclude with lesson five with why you need to study ethnic studies. And they actually sell ethnic studies to the students who then are going to dive into these different ones like indigenous studies. Black studies. So first of all, we take indigenous as if this is an ethnicity. Like these people have their own, they're a monolith, first of all, when we're talking right. about literally hundreds and hundreds of different ethnicities and tribes and so on. But we're going to place and locate these people in a certain section. And now we're going to talk about all the sadness, right? Exactly. Colonization displacement, the boarding schools, which is a horror show, uh, the indigenous rights movement, struggle, contemporary resistance, more struggle. There's nothing, you said, there's nothing in there about reconciliation. There's nothing about, about uh, accomplishment. There's nothing about triumph. There's nothing about heroism. It's just all like, Ugh. and then black studies, same, same thing. thing. It's all the same, Latino studies. Every single one of these could be its own year long course with full of balance and debate about what this means so the students could make up their own minds and walk out of the classroom and decide where they stand on these issues politically socially culturally or whatever and i might add i don't think that 16 and 17 year olds are prepared enough with the amount of knowledge and so on historical knowledge and so forth to be able to do that this would be more of a college level study not saying they couldn't do it at all i'm just saying i think it's pretty heavy stuff it's extremely really heavy. Do. It's also, I mean, let's look at where our kids are at academically. They they even talk about this, how, how bad COVID was for education and how much your kids are suffering. And then we're going to throw kids who are already mentally struggling. We're going to throw this at them. Exactly. Exactly. And they go, you know, so this was some of the stuff I covered, the purpose of ethnic studies. Um, they, you know, go straight at this really struck me. Uh, yes. A worldview is a collection of beliefs that shape the way a person thinks about and interacts with the surrounding environment. Where, while there is no singular white culture, white people are not white people. First of all, just saying that to a group of high school students. Yes. White people are not. And Matt, flip it around. Black people fill in the blank and everybody would recoil. Right. Be like, wait, we're talking about individuals like they're part of a monolith. But it's okay to do this. And they say, you know, white Anglo-Americans. Well, that leaves out me. I'm Jewish, right? So <laughs> um, it, because European Americans are racially and ethnically privileged. Oh, really? Again, they have yet to define what that means or le leave any room for argument. So their, their opinions are all throughout there. It's obviously trying to set the stage. Here, this was interesting. What's the difference between equality and equity? And they want to put that out there to, you know, fair does not always mean equal. Right. And, and they never say said it did. Well, and they say it on the page previously. They say that the goal is that more equitable and more equitable world. Um, one more. Sorry. But, um, oh, so sorry, here? The, one, the one above it. Uh, oh, this one. Here. Yeah. So okay. equitable future, right? The more equitable future. So, and <laughs> that to them means a more fair future, but defined by whom right so and equitable it, means equal outcomes that's what it means equal outcomes for every single person it does not matter I'm not sure if they mean that though well, i'm not sure they mean that anymore i i know i don't i think what it is yeah. is they said they'd say throughout this that you know white angle people are privileged Right. And we have to have a more more fair means not always equal. And we've heard Ibram X. Kendi and others say 
that we can't have equality under the law because past discrimination necessitates present right. and future discrimination to restore fairness, which is going to mean a period of what? Inequality for whom? White people. So right. it's almost like it was unfair for this group of people to define who got what as if that's how it happened. It isn't. <laughs> and then and then they're saying, so it's our turn. Now we get to decide what they get and what we get, and we should get more now to make things fair. It's really how like two siblings who don't get along very well and are under the age of 10 might resolve their differences about how many cookies they can have. It's not rational at all. No. Um, so it's really sad. That These people are mentally, um, the, there's something called post-traumatic slave syndrome. And that is, at least there's a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And that is what I see here. I see people who are so angry and so embittered that they, they, have, no, they have no space in their life for gratitude um, or, gra or grace at all. And even though the people, like the people who are quoted in this book, they're all, they've all achieved success. <laughs> they, they, they make a lot of money to peddle this stuff. And yet they still can't get out of that mental place of, you know, we're miserable and we're oppressed. Mm. Do you think that it comes from lessons like this? So in other words, there's nothing in their, I shouldn't say there's nothing. I don't know what each individual's life has been like. And there may have been individuals right. involved in this who've had some pretty rough experiences. And that's not only a function of race. I mean, human beings go through things. And I think it's, if you can explain it to yourself as, well, I'm black or well, I'm Hispanic or well, my parents grew up poor or something, then that can give you a sense of control or reason why this happened. A lot of people walk around and say, why, why, why? But it's not like any of them were literally enslaved themselves. Right. And so then I start to wonder, since anyone really living in the first world is already, anyone is right. privileged to a certain level, right? Um, it, by even by their definition, do you think it's they're having a like a contact trauma? Like I'm going to read about all this stuff, and then I'm going to feel those feelings. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, me learning about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? right? And learning about the Holocaust was traumatizing. There's no question. Now, was it traumatizing to the level of a you know a soldier coming back from war? No. But was it scary? Yes. Did it make me, you know, keep me up a few nights? Yes. Um, did it make me look around a little bit more at how people treated each other? Of course it did. But the difference was that I saw was when it was taught to us, it was very much contextualized within its time frame, right. within, you know, what else was going on historically. It, it, it wasn't presented as, and everybody hates you to this day. Like it, it wasn't, systemic anti-Semitism, right? No, the it way that we were taught it, the way, I mean, when we saw these things, the way that we were taught it was that I would have looked at my Jewish friends and loved them a little bit more. That's the way that we were, we were taught. It wasn't a matter of, okay, let's all revolt against, because the same situation, there's a point where you say, my God, I'm thankful that I didn't have to go through that. Yes. But that's yes. not happening. We are pretending there are kids today who will say that things going on today are as bad as they were doing during the civil rights movement now. Yeah. And that's, that's just, I well, what, what they're creating is kind of, it, it's definitely the most racist time I've ever lived in for sure. Um, but, but they're creating, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. They're creating they're that. Exactly. What I find on this page to be the most interesting is on the other side, um, the words that are highlighted, racism, mm -hmm. sexism, homophobia, and ableism. What the heck? But they describe it as these different types of power. Yes. So they say, what is intersectionality? According to Crenshaw, it is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. So they, they never question that. They just say, according to Crenshaw, it is this. Yes. But then here it says, what do you think? And I'm, I'm hoping, oh, they're going to ask them if they agree. But no, it says multiple elements of someone's identity, including race, gender, sexuality, class, age, and ability, can shape their experiences. What are different aspects of your own identity? Not, do you agree with Crenshaw's theory? Right. 
does this map does this does this track with your reality it's hey now you do it now it's your turn Go also what does it have to wheel. do with learning about different culture that's that's really <laughs> that's my issue is it's like parents come in thinking that their children are going to be learning about other cultures. They think that they're going to have potlucks of, you know, Russian food and things like that. They're not, they're not, no. their kids are going to get a steady diet of this. No. And in fact, the only ethnicities that they mention as ethnicities down to that level are English and French. Yeah. Cause European is not an ethnicity. Right. So English and French, even when they get to, you know, Hispanic slash Latino, that's not an ethnicity. Right. That's a made up political term. <laughs> and, and it is. And I know people will say, you know, even, you know, Latino is a Hollywood term as so is Latina. Latinx is straight up offensive and culturally appropriating. I mean, this is what I've been told by people who are otherwise called that. Like, don't call me that. There, I'm Mexican. I'm Puerto Rican. I'm, right. you know, Ecuadorian. I'm from El Salvador. I'm, the, and that those are ethnicities. These are not ethnicities. Yes. So they're not even using the word properly. If we wanted to have a real conversation and really unify people, we would let people talk about their cultures in general. the The idea that white people are the only people that can be racist blows my mind because there are people of this group who don't like this group and we all call them the same group. So right. is that, is that our bias? Maybe I'm not going to say that we don't have biases, but I am going to say that just because you have a bias does not mean that you should become yeah. a Marxist. <laughs> like, I mean, didn't, didn't, didn't Spike Lee make a whole movie about light skin and dark skin blacks and how the biases within the black community based oh, yeah. on how dark your skin is. So, you know, and of course there, you know, Mizrahi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, there's like a healthy tension there. Right. Uh, you've got Japanese, Chinese, then you've got Japanese, Korean, yeah. Vietnamese. I mean, to, to say every, Asian, it's like, well, where do the people from Pakistan come into there? And we're pretty sure the Pakistan, people from Pakistan, the people from India are not exactly chummy. <laughs> so it, it, you're yeah. not, you're not getting, what, it, where are these places? And well, that, I just well, think it's kind of weird. Well, that's the whole thing is that everything that they're doing, they call it best practices. That's their new kind of phrase is we're following best practices. Everything they're doing is the opposite of best practices. It is worse. Right. It's the worst thing that you can do. Oh, this one. This yeah. Got, this one got me. I showed this the last time. They're also what they're really, you know, we talk about what it really is, the section of the video, what it really is. Yeah. And what I see throughout this book, this was the first instance of it. And I saw it pop up multiple times. What do you think 16 and 17 year old is the proper role of your parents? <laughs> I mean, they ask it multiple times in this book. Where do you think parents ought to have a say in your, you know, upbringing? What do you think they, and it's almost always to the negative. Like they're, they're making it pretty clear yep. that parents in their opinion should not have a say that parents get in the way. Um, and they show angry white light. Now for all we know, she could be screaming for trans bathrooms. We have no idea what she's yelling about, but they, I they put her up there and make it look all scary. And then they have the question here which is what role, if any, if any, should parents and guardians play in determining what takes place at school? I got to say, this was the wake up call for my husband. To me. This, this was the wake up call. I have, we've been in a battle over homeschool or not to homeschool. And when I finally said, this is a curriculum book and you can see where, it, you know, you sign the first person and whoever has it every year, it's yeah. really a curriculum book. And he's like, well, of course, any kid who's upset is going to be like, I hate my parents and my school supports it, you know? And um, yeah. And the other thing about this is, is I don't know how many people have been able to black out 2020, but there were so many school events. So the only ones that could go on were ones that were in support of Black Lives Matter. And That's right. there were definitely people, you know, doing sit-ins, people using timers and telling Caucasian people they spoke too much. Very, very aggressive things were happening. 
that's not in this book. It is only showing what they find unsavory. Right. And they, they tell you right up front here, why is examining protests and other forms of activism an important part of ethnic studies? It, presuming that it is. So that when we frame a question as why is this important, the student's only answer is to come back with some reason it's important. They don't have the option to say, I don't think it is, or I don't think it should be here, or I think actually I'd rather learn about what makes different ethnicities different than to talk about protests constantly. Nope. This is central to the whole thing is protest, grievance, activism. That's the big part. And then this, you said you thought this summed it all up, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to read that? Yeah. You and I cannot be free in America or anywhere else where there is capitalism and imperialism until we can get people to recognize that they themselves have to make us make the struggle and have to make the fight for freedom every day in the year, every year until they win it. They're not, they're not working for freedom, right? So their revolution is what they're working for. Right. And they don't even know that they are water carriers. They are water carriers for big corporations, for the most capitalistic of people who've paid to have these curriculums created. That's, and and they're just doing that. Well, it's what's sad is they don't know they're free. No, they and they're have. undertaking to push to be less free. Absolutely. I, I mean, you could almost you could almost understand the Bolsheviks in a feudal system in Russia who were literally not free. OK, right. and yeah. say, well, you know, they can almost be excused for pushing back against the czar or rising up for a revolution because they how could things get worse? Right. They didn't couldn't imagine it getting worse than <laughs> feudalism and being under the thumb of the of the czar. Um, but these are people who live in the lap of luxury compared to the people who fought for those kinds of revolutions. Um, and they are free. The proof that they're free is they're able to go out and march in the middle of COVID and nobody's going to do anything to them while average people who didn't have that excuse had to get, you know, were locked up at home or got arrested and couldn't go to work if they tried, you know, if they tried to go to work. So this really stands out to me as what it really is about. What it really is about is dismantling capitalism and you know making the kids who take this course think that america the west in general but especially america it's also europe um is a very bad oppressive place yeah everything all the way throughout this book every single um every single chapter the different groups all of their stories are stories of especially colonialism, especially right. how did their land get taken? So, right. um, I'm yeah. Going to, I'm going to show some of the opinions as facts next mm. because it's really important, mm-hmm. I think, for the audience to understand that when you're talking to kids this age, again, you know, their, their background knowledge, even college kids, if you are not pretty steeped in world history, U.S. history and civics, science, uh, you know, geography, you are not going, the, the questions aren't even going to occur to you that this may or may not be accurate. And so then when they present things to them in the ways that we're going to show you, um, the kid has no choice but to perceive it as, as a fact. And that is literally the definition of indoctrination, is it not? I don't even have the wherewithal to question you. Well, it's also a struggle session because those kids, we don't know if they are asking these, some of them, they say, write this down. And some of them it's ask, you know, asking in the classroom, right? So you you answer that question in the the classroom and half the kids look at you like, well, that wasn't the right answer. Worse, a teacher might look at you as that wasn't the right answer. Exactly. And yeah, there's a lot of, you know, learning goals and key terms. And, you know, we'll look at some of that. But this stood out to me. Experts have debated. I love the use of the word experts here. (laughs) How Africans first came to the Americas. Some point to evidence that suggests they may have been here before Europeans. Really? Some experts do that, do they? (laughs) That's fascinating. Because that's that's like a long way. Go ahead. That's going to be really interesting when they do the land grab. 
and the Native Americans want their land because they were here first. And the, um, they call themselves the Moors, the original Moors or something. That, that group comes in and says, no, we were everywhere first. Yeah. It's just and, not and, unifying. And, <laughs> yeah. And then, or, you know, people have told me like, no, no, they, they came over on, you know, in boats from Africa first. And I've asked, well, where are the settlements? Where is the evidence? Where are the fossils? Where, you know, where are the bones? Where's anything? They, it takes a while to get here. And then when they w were here, they had to have stayed for a little while and maybe somebody died, you know, like you would have found some evidence yeah. that we're here. And I, people have actually told me with a straight face, no, they just came, looked around and left. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. It's not like the cool going to the corner store and deciding you don't really need anything and you're going to leave. It, it, I, people with a straight face have said that to me. And I'm like, no. And, and if you press them, they'll say, well, you know, they came with some of the Spaniards. When the Spanish came out, that's not coming right, before that's Europeans. Not. It's coming with Europeans, which I'll grant you is very likely. But it's not coming before Europeans. And then they'll they'll split hairs and say, well, there was that time when you know they were in, they were had conquered Europe, and you're you know the, the Spain wasn't Spain yet, and it was conquered by the Moors. Oh, I see. So then, okay, I can't even. It comes down to this very ugly one-upmanship. Um, I was listening to a person yesterday who was talking and said, uh, when they bombed Hiroshima the Japanese were given X by America for what they went through. Um, you know, all blacks should be given X as well. And I asked, I said, so what's the number? What number would be okay where you would, where you would find satisfaction and be able to move on with your life? Because basically you're saying that all of the struggle or whatever is, you know, worth a number. So is it, is it a car and a house? You're saying, you know, 40 acres and a mule still, that's what you want. And then I said, now let's look at this because what happens for these kids is they look at every single black person and they think, oh, you've been through so much. Well, a lot of us haven't been here for more than two generations. That's a fact. So a lot of us did not live through slavery. So why that's are we right. painting with a broad brush by experts so that the kids in the classroom, especially where I live in rural, in a rural place where there's like three kids of color, why are you painting their experience as if that's their experience, especially if they were adopted this generation from another country? Right. Not their story. Well, I find it, I find it hilarious throughout the whole book. They talk about negatives, about how damaging stereotypes are, how we shouldn't stereotype people. And then in the very next breath, they stereotype people. Yeah. It's, <laughs> if it's not our hypocrisy, it's, you know, it's not progressivism. So <laughs> it's a lot of projection too. The, the, everything they say other people are doing. So that stood out to me. I thought that was yes. bizarre. And then this too, Africans were abducted primarily from areas in Western Africa. Interesting. So we're going back to, you know, uh, Kunta Kinte now where there were nets thrown over people when, you know, so they're not even being taught that the vast majority of slaves who were brought primarily by the way by the portuguese and the spanish right and primarily to the caribbean not to the united states like a tiny percentage came i think about three percent came right. to the united states they were sold by warring tribe like they would lose a war or whatever the war the tribal chieftain or whoever who won the king who won would sell people to europeans because he won a war that that's kind of a thing that happens and it has happened since forever the romans would take slaves uh you know the slavs were slaves different people across europe were made slaves because they were conquered by conquering armies and empires and so on and they were not uniquely black so but to say they were abducted makes it sound like everybody was living in these perfectly functional societies and along come the europeans and, and it was some kind of human trafficking operation where they just right. snuck in in the night and grabbed them. And that's not what happened. Well, in all fairness, in these within these books, this is why I say teach the bad, teach the ugly, but also teach the beautiful. In some of these chapters, there are they do make an attempt to be more fair about the ugly. So they do say that some of these people were captured. 
um, by warring tribes. But it's very watered down. It's very, very simple how much of that happened. It doesn't talk about, you know, the extreme violence or things like that. It just makes it, it makes it very simple. And it has nothing, like I said, there's nothing hopeful. It's yeah. just. And we go. Yeah. And we go to, you know, Black Lives Matter. And we, and we have the perpetuation. What I noticed too in this whole book is all the imagery is very negative and designed to trigger an emotion. So we go back to that's horrifying. Okay. Right. That's horrifying. Yep. And I'm not saying don't teach the horrors of slavery. That's not what I'm saying. So somebody's going to comment like, what do you want us to do? Clean up slavery for you? And it's like, no, I'm saying that when you see the majority to the point of the, all of the images yes. are negative and you don't see anything, anyone smiling in the whole book, unless they're with a fist in the air yep. and you don't see anything hopeful. And then you have things like this where not only are they angry, but I can't breathe all but human beings deserve respect. Mm -hmm. So they're holding up signs, you know, saying I can't breathe. Yes. This is a George Floyd thing, but of course we all know factually that one of the reasons he couldn't breathe was Trans he was, he was ODing on right. fentanyl, which suppresses your respiratory function. And of course, none of that's in here. None of the controversy no. for black lives matters is in here. And that's super upsetting as somebody who, who watched it and, and knows the story and knows about, you know, by large mansions and, and the fact that they openly say they're Marxist. They openly yeah. say those things, but none of that's in here. It's only this wonderful organization started. I think, where is it? I'm trying to find the other Black Lives Matter thing. Yeah. Um, mm, I think, no, I think I only put in that, it yeah. might've been somewhere else, but, but this is again, you know, in, under the heading of, you know, opinions as facts. Right. Um, first formed in 2013 as an online movement to bring attention to black victims of police brutality. That's not its purpose. If you go and you look at the history of Black Lives Matter, you look at the people behind it, you look at the um, the uh, movement for black lives, which is the big parent organization. They are 100 percent a Marxist organization. Their goal is to change the laws of the United States of America, to undo a lot of our Constitution, to empty our prisons. Um, to get, you know, reparations. They have a whole huge agenda that is not just to bring attention to black pol victims of police brutality. No, I'm the very- The press do a pretty good job of that. Throughout this book, I'm very much reminded of um, uh, former President Barack Obama's pastors saying, not God bless America, God damn America. That's what very this book so. seems like. It's just teaching you to damn it. And then one more thing. I don't think we have a picture of it, but one of the pages talked about early on in the book, it talks about how some people relate to logic, but even more relate to emotion. So how can we use emotion to bring about? Yes, that's in unit one. <laughs> and I covered that in the first video okay. <laughs> where I pointed it out. I said, they are explicitly telling the children to lean into emotion for persuasive purposes. Yeah. When the whole purpose of education when I was growing up was to teach you not to do that, except in very small doses. Like, yes, pathos can help your argument, but presuming all of your other arguments are logical. In other words, you need to, it still needs to be a sound argument. You don't right. get to replace logic with pathos. Right. Um, but they absolutely, just, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> oh, they absolutely do. <laughs> And then we have other things like here's more picture protests. And I this is hard to see, but it says U.S. imperialism in Latin America. Yeah. Now, again, this is a Marxist term. We can debate all day long whether American foreign policy in Latin America was good, bad or indifferent. OK, but calling something imperialism is a very specific decision that you make. I mean, that is you've decided and you're putting out there, this is what it was when that is not a fact. That is an opinion. And it's largely an opinion held by Marxists. Right. Um, because we backed, we tended to back the non-Marxist side in most of these revolutions or most of these situations. I'm not saying it was great. Please, do, again, don't hear me taking sides. I am arguing as a teacher and saying that I think it is leading to tell teenagers that it was U.S. imperialism. That is taking a point of view. 
Well, and the point of view, again, is driven throughout this book. And the shocking thing that I'd found was that it is about a land grab. So they absolutely want Texas to be given back to Mexico. Yep. They absolutely believe that it, Africa should get certain parts. And it's all over. They want our country torn to shreds. That's really yep. what I'm seeing throughout this book. It's also astounding to me that they talk about demonstrators protesting U.S. interference in Venezuela. Yeah. Has, has yeah. anyone taken a look at Venezuela lately? So it, are these kids even learning what has happened to Venezuela? So they, they can come away from this lesson thinking that it was wrong of us to even attempt to keep communism out of Venezuela. Right. But they're not going to learn what happened when it, that didn't work. They call it U.S. expansion. No, expansion means we would actually like occupy a place. You know, they, they even use terms like squatting, gunboat diplomacy, annexation. It's a much more complicated thing. The geopolitics of all of this is so, so complicated. And once again, has what to do with ethnic studies? What does this have to do with ethnicity? So they're also presuming that any child who is from, quote, Latin America, or who has ancestors from there, somehow desperately needs to know this about how bad the country they, by the way, escaped to, and it took them in, how bad it is. Right. How damaging is that? That Not just to the country, but to the individual. There's no stories about, like when you get into the stories about China, there's not nothing about no. um, coming here. I think they have one, like one line, people came here fleeing Maoism. That's it. And, but yep. the majority of it is, you know, anti-Asian hate and let's protest that. Not the fact that Asian Americans have done quite well because they look forward rather than looking backwards. So they look at, they go, I am one generation away from success. And that's how they raise their kids. They, they also take a position of representation matters. Right. Right, so they're just telling you straight up that representation in media and so forth and casting and so forth, that it matters. You can't be what you can't see. I personally, as a teacher, would have an entire debate on that subject. Do you yeah. agree or disagree with this statement? There's no right answer. And I would, I would want the students to take that apart and some would agree and some would disagree. And that would be an opportunity for them to share their ideas and maybe come out somewhere, you know, somewhere in the middle or something, you know, whatever they would believe that's fine. But to just come into the class and say, this is so, is opinion masquerading as fact. Yes. You know, representation in the media matters. Not to everyone, it doesn't. Right. You know, we'll have a much narrower view of the world. We miss opportunities to learn from others, et cetera. I'll tell you a sad story about somebody I believe missed an opportunity to learn from others. It was the head of the school my kids went to when they were going to public charter school. Um, she told me that it was so important for her to have representation in college that she, there was, because there was only one professor she could go to for mentorship and talk to because there was only one black professor in her department. So she said, my whole college career, there was only one professor I could talk to. I, I said, why? There was only one who was black. And I said, so how much mentoring and learning and growth did you miss out on because you wouldn't even give a white professor a chance? Right. And she looked at me like I just spoke Greek or something. Like, why would anyone say that to her? Of course, I can only learn things from people who look like me. I can only relate to people who look like me. I couldn't possibly become a professor or a teacher or something who is white because they're white. Well, I'm not saying you become white. You become a professor. So... It's it's culturally very different in a, in many African American homes, not all of them, but in many African American homes, you were taught to distrust people of any other ethnicity, but especially white people. I'm talking when you're when you're tiny, tiny, tiny. You're learning these things, and then the projection is racism is taught at home. I've never seen amongst my friends and peers, I've never seen people raise their kids to distrust other cultures, 
my, my white friends. I've never seen that, but I absolutely have seen that within the black community. I've, I've lived that. I've had people, you know, make their assumptions based on the fact that I'm lighter than some. I've had people make their assumptions based on the fact that I'm darker than others. Right. But the fact is, is that the projection the well, in our house, we were taught to, to mistrust people. We were taught, I mean, honestly, you're taught to be a bigot. And then you project that on everybody else. And you tell everybody else that, oh, well, they must be bigots when you have no, no basis. In fact, like, so if you're, if a child is getting that at home, this kind of a curriculum is only going to validate that. Absolutely. You're not going to have their biases checked or their, or their, their pre- prejudices, you know, undone. It'll just be solidified. That's really sad. It's extremely, um, it's heartbreakingly sad to, to watch it and to try. I mean, when I say things like, well, I consider myself this first and, you know, an American and my faith matters to me and and being a parent, those things matter to me. People say, well, why are you ashamed of being black? And I said, I'm not ashamed of being black. It's just, it's like number seven on my list of, you know, of 10 of, of the most important things to me, my skin color and my eye color might as well be the same thing. I know that the world sees me differently, you know, and, and, those are conversations that you can have, but you have to have them at a place where everybody feels equal. And I do not believe that most of these lessons will make most of the students feel safe. They are right. an absolute attack. They they say things in these like misguided, um, backwards. These are the words that they use for ideals that are, are um, out of touch. That's another one that they use. Like the Martin Luther for. King ideal. Mm-hmm. That exactly. we would be judged by. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then we have this, I thought was interesting, the, you know, gender stereotypes impact the way women are perceived. Uh, the cult of domesticity, they call it a cult of domesticity. And in the 1800s, the standard of femininity, et cetera. Well, again, this may be true, but this is a whole college class. I read an entire book about this subject in graduate school. So they take things that are very deep and have, that would require you to spend a lot of time and read a lot of primary sources to really deeply understand what, you know, how this came to be, uh, why it lasted so long, what actually broke it up eventually. It wasn't protest, by the way, and and so on. And then you could have a fuller understanding of how stereotypes, you know, come and go. Everything in this book strikes me as they believe that there's some like army of little social construct elves somewhere manufacturing social constructs in some evil evil workshop and then shoving them out into the world and patting themselves on the back and then it's it only through some kind of armed struggle and resistance do they fight off the evil elves who yes. who built these things and that's just as if you can't just wake up one day and go yeah I don't want to do that I'm going to go live something else especially in the United States of America where even back in the day, you know, I've talked to people who are in their 90s and they laugh. They're like, I don't know what y'all are talking about. I've been working since I, you know, women. I was working at 12. You know, I went to, I went to work. What do you mean women can't work? I was working. I was, uh, uh, you know, like they, I had my own money and then my grandmother was a secretary. Like I've spoken to people who are just mystified at the young women walking around going, oh, it must have been hard in your day when you weren't allowed to work. And these women are like, what are you talking about? I well, work all day, every day. They're <laughs> also missing the other narrative that there's a huge amount of people going back to the trad wife. There's a lot of people who are feeling like they were misled by feminism. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying you have to bring, if you're going to actually educate someone, then you have yeah. to bring both parts to the table. You can't exactly. just give them this and say, oh, this is the only thing that's right unless you're an authoritarian who wants to control the minds of children. Exactly. And you want to put forth what you think is the right way. Uh, This is another one, white, black wealth gap, white families in the United States with much higher median wealth. You know, okay, they talk about wealth based on what? Property ownership, money in the bank, investments, inheritance, you know, like what are we talking about here as wealth? Amount of debt? So some of these people could, their wealth could be, you know, invisible because they owe a ton of money. But 
they don't explain that here. They also, so what are they talking about? They also leave out, this is the stuff that bothers me. What, the things that they leave out, the things they omit, they, they leave out Jack and Jill society. They leave out that there were African Americans who owned slaves and who were prosperous. There were African American slaves who married their, their mistress, but not in the way we normally call a mistress, right? Like the slave master would die and then the mistress would marry the slave. They leave out the successful, the judges, the doctors, the lawyers, all of these people. Congressmen. It's all out. What yeah, I mean, re in Reconstruction, there were black con congressmen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. they also leave out that redlining was not strictly by race. It was about credit. Right. And, it, you know, it, you know, yes, I it, it disproportionately affected neighborhoods that were mostly black, but it wasn't exclusive. People talk about redlining like someone said, oh, let's put a line around the black neighborhood. That's not what it was. It was like, we're not going to lend money over here because the income, blah, blah, and the right. neighborhood and the property values and so on. And they felt like it was a poor investment. You could have had poor whites over there too, but we're not allowed to talk about that. The poor white person is never discussed. Yeah. There is no the Italians, visible. Because the Italians absolutely were, were redlined. And that's, that's that place where I go, I want to be as fair as possible. You know, I don't know that they always lie in this book. I just know that they omit so much that it leaves a person feeling hopeless. Well, and there's framing. Like I said, right. here's another picture of protest. So yep. the pictures are always of protest. The framing is always around, you know, we're going to state something as truth, like educational inequality. And then they say the reformer and politician Horace Mann called education the great equalizer. Yeah, that wasn't a good thing. He was a racist. Yeah. <laughs> he was a eugenicist. Yeah. So it's, it's another one of those, like, I'm going to present you this thing like he's this great guy. And they've done that for generations. Same with John Dewey. These right. people, all the people behind the public school system were absolutely xenophobic, racist, uh, misogynistic. They were, they actually did tick the boxes of all the bad things. And what they meant by great equalizer is they wanted to get everybody at the same low level of barely functioning, you know, just enough to keep them from rebelling. Right. But not encroaching on, you know, the good people. So you know, they... I was listening to something yesterday and, and um, he was the first kind of, I think basically like micromanager, but he was super wealthy. Anyways, he was talking about how the people who worked in the, in the plants were not any smarter than apes. And he was talking about, talking about John D Rockefeller. It wasn't John D Rockefeller. Oh, it, wasn't it, was, Rockefeller? it was John's okay. John something though. But, um, but he was talking about how they, and that he knew the right way. Because he believed that gorillas could learn as much as these people could. That's right. And listening to that is is hard because you know, I mean, today, that seems to be what a lot of people think about those of us who live in rural areas, choose to live a country lifestyle, choose, you know, are just more either working class or even upper working class, but not to their level. If you're not at their level, then they believe they know better for you. And exactly. They, and it is literally putting putting people in a cage. It's or I guess not literally, but it's it's putting people in a mental cage. And I believe this has happened to African Americans since about the 1920s. They were the guinea pigs. And now everything that worked to make African Americans those that are, which is not everyone, let me be clear on that again, but to make those people who are stuck in bitterness and not able to rise above. That's right. They've taken what they did with them, and now they're putting it on all of our children through through curriculum like this. That's right. It's also written in a very strange way. Down here at the bottom where it says, even when students attend, present tense. They go, went from past tense yes. to present tense. And they say, even when students attend integrated schools. Like, we're so far past that. The curriculum often supports a white supremacist narrative. 
And th there's no question about that. We're just going to say it's true and we're going to keep going. Mm -hmm. When students only see themselves playing victimized roles in the curriculum, you mean like this one? Like <laughs> this one? <laughs> like this one right here? Um, or do not see themselves while well, other achievements, et cetera, academic performance becomes stigmatized. You mean like this one? So that's what they, they say things and then they do it. They do the very thing that they say yes. is so bad. Everything in here is a depiction of victimhood. And the only kind of triumph that's allowed is through activism, is through revolution, is through fighting violence, protest, and that sort of thing, being rebellious. It's, yes. You can't just individually achieve. You must join a group, first of all, Black Lives Matter, or the this coalition of the that, and the such and such organization for the betterment of the blah, 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 the NAACP. You have to be part of a group and you have to protest and, and be active. And then they go and say, you know, what we shouldn't show people is only victims. Two points on that. Here's another one. So, so, so the first point on that is that if you remember back to when you were in middle school or elementary school, we had those little books when we we're really little, right? Where um, like Beth throw the ball to John, right? Or something like that. Um, at least in the books that I've had and the books I taught with when I taught reading to first graders two years ago, um, they made an effort to be diverse. So you would have, I wish I would have sent the picture to you, but um, you would have like a doctor who was black or a police officer who was Hispanic or a veterinarian who was Asian. So you already had this representation. It was already there because we'd already figured out the best practices and that normalized it to all of these kids. You just see that and they never, they never wondered. Like I would ask the kids questions and they would never say, oh, the black one. They just, they were just like, oh, the doctor, right? They never, they never needed that. And it was normal to them. Now we're saying that in order to have representation, you know, that, that black person also must be queer. So we're using their words and, and putting them into, we're, we're putting this into the curriculum by words that people will be like, oh, that, that sounds great. I want representation. And they don't know what they're getting. The other point is joy, because you said that you can only have success or achievement um, throughout the struggle. And that's the whole thing. Sure. Like if you look at the new definition of joy um, is that it's, joy throughout the struggle. It's not the joy of the human experience. It's not that we've all right. overcome and where's that common ground. It right. is, I have joy, even though we danced, even though, you know, they hosed us down or they turned the dogs on us. Well, my friend Juana says it's socialist realism, um, you know, at least you know, in art, but also in yeah. this sort of thing that the hero is toil and toil is unthinkable outside the collective. Yes. So we don't we don't talk about individual uh, achievement. Good. Even here it says ethnic studies empowers students to fight racism in their own communities. So they're they're positioning ethnic studies itself as the thing that the kids need in order to fight racism. There's no way for you to do it alone. There's no way for you to just live your life and fight racism by your existence. No. And you now also need anti-racism, which we've talked about on this right. channel and your channel. Um, and then there's Paula Frere, the Marxist, who features so prominently in this entire curriculum, they bring him up again and again and again. He's in a spotlight, I think, I don't know, half a dozen times. So it's very clear that this is Frerian. I'm going to present you with this struggle narrative and put you in a position to ask questions about or answer questions about it and then tell you the only way out of it is revolution is is to fight um that there's really or that any progress that's been made in the past was through fighting so this is just so sad to me like i said it's always oh there's you know more black lives matter stuff um legacy uh. of colonialism again we're talking about opinions as fact um, not that there wasn't colonialism, but that when they say colonialism, they mean it in term in that negative way of not just people came to this country and there were colonies and then they were not, you know, it's more like it's always bad when people migrate from one place to another place and create a new country 
that's always a bad thing or integrate and, you know, kind of take over whatever the dominant culture was by any means. You could let's do it be even real. Just it's, it's not bad when they do it because it's exactly what they're doing. When they force right. their kids into these schools and they shove this down their throat, how is that not colonizing them? Yes, exactly. But like you said, it's, it, it's not when they do it. Um, <laughs> there's some more, you know, there's some more about what inequality means. Uh, most societies have different ways of categorizing and ranking people. In the United States, physical and cultural differences have been used to justify systems of oppression, then keep inequality as a status quo. Opinion as fact. Persistent inequality. Comprehension strategy. We talked about this in the last show. Reading to identify causation is one way to link concepts across your reading informational text. Do look for, co for correlations and then call them causational. Yep. It is astounding the way they're leading these kids around by the nose. Here's some more generational inequality, inequality in the criminal justice system. What do you think, aside from economic considerations, how might access to safe, affordable housing impact a person? The presumption being that access to affordable housing is something that someone gives you or that people are given or not given, as opposed to I go find it or I make it or some other thing. These are all opinions masquerading as facts. Again, what is it enough though? Because if you give a person a tiny, you know, a tiny little hut, a, one of those like train car apartments, and they have already been seated through this resentment kind of, this is the way they think. They constantly think of resentment. Do you think the jealousy ends the second you put them in a hut when they're looking across the street and they see someone with a nicer house? No. And also yeah. I've seen them where I've seen where they hold their signs and they say, we demand free healthcare. And then underneath it, it says housing is healthcare. So they want free housing. But even when it's given, so for example, in places like Seattle, yeah. And, you know, that we're, they've tried things like we're going to put these people in a place to live. It just turns into, they just destroy it. They've been putting yeah. people in hotels in New York city. They're destroying the hotels. Yes. So even when they are given free housing, they don't, they didn't earn it. So they don't have that same attachment to it. People are negating the like human nature. They're negating all free will and acting like human beings are just bundles of nerves with, you know, reactions to things, stimuli, almost like dogs. And that if we yes. just put them in the right little pen, everything will be fine. Even the language they use, black Americans are sent to state prison at nearly five times the rate of white Americans. Like somebody just goes around and go, you, you, and you go to prison. There was nothing that happened. They didn't actually do anything and get convicted that sent them to prison. They were sent just sent, passively No discussion sent. on why Never. either, is there? No Never. discussion on why. Zero. There's no discussion. Threat. They say inequality in the criminal justice system, but they never talk about crime statistics. They never talk about any of that. It's almost like we're, we're not allowed to talk about that. Right. But they were sent to prison. Yep. And yeah, that's messed up. Uh, <laughs> climate justice, why is this in here? What does that have to do with ethnic studies exactly? Right. I mean... Environmental racism. So when I was when I was at the Capitol speaking, um, and a person for the UEA had given an example of what a fourth grade class would look like on this subject, and they said we would want fourth graders to be able to explain why flooding in Missouri um, is a is a direct result of climate change due to systemic racism, and the senators who were in the room were like, what does that have to do with Utah at all? And they were pretty exactly. shocked by it because it, it just, it didn't make any sense, but it does make sense when you know that this is the goal. This ethnic studies is really a tro Trojan horse. To well, and it says right here in the word, it says solidarity means unity based on common goals. <laughs> the term is important to ethnic studies. They're telling you they're communists. They're screaming it in your face. And yet I bet their parents go, this is, if you don't want to use this, you're a racist. <laughs> um, it's specifically because of inter-ethnic solidarity within groups such as the Third World Liberation Front. Where have you noticed examples of solidarity? You better have the <laughs> subtext there. Right. And 
that's it. It's like you can't possibly Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson is the reason millions of people are dead in Africa. So I find that rather ironic. Little Miss, we can't possibly spray for mosquitoes. Um, yeah. There, there, there's so much in here that could be debunked or at least shown to be extraordinarily biased and sugarcoated in terms of the communists they're featuring in their in their spotlights the the groups that they say are so great which actually in many cases committed murder set off bombs uh tortured people i mean there's something on che guevara in one of the things yep you know he's just positioned as you know he's like a resistance fighter <laughs> but he's you know otherwise a fine guy fine fine right. gentleman but martin luther king isn't so, remember going back to him well, yeah yeah black lives matter again consider this Many of the instances of police brutality that garnered national attention were recorded on smartphones. How has technology changed activism? <laughs> you know, so um, by editing parts out. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that that's uh, that was the um, that was the section on opinion as facts, and then we had uh, how unbalanced it was. Now I think it's we've already shown a lot of how it's not balanced. Right. But I noticed a couple of things that stood out to me. Um, whenever they show his, you know, people who are lat, you know, Latin, Latino, Latin, it's almost always women. Have you noticed that? I did there, not. There very, yeah. few, very few cases of men. There they are again. More women. Yep. Women. And I have a theory. I can't prove it. But here's my theory. And see, here's how they have indigenous women. Mm -hmm. da, 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 women, all this. And my theory is that Hispanic men, men from Latin America, men from Mexico, pick, pick whatever you want, that um, it's a it's a patriarchal cult, patriarchal Catholic culture, primarily uh, what they might call toxic masculinity. In other words, that machismo is, is a big part of culture for many of these ethnicities, not all, but, you know, like a fair amount. Right. And I can't shake the feeling that this is to elevate the, the women and downplay the men because they actively don't want to promote the, the men and that they do it in the black culture too. And in in BLM, it's women, mm -hmm. women are at the forefront, women, lesbians, trans people, but you really don't see them talking about black men who are the ones who get punished the most or go to prison black men primarily. Right. right. But they talk very little about black men who achieve black oh, yeah. men who are, you know, high achievers. So it's almost like the only black men we're allowed to talk about are locked up in prison. Who've mm -hmm. been abused in some way or whatever, or committed a crime, and, you know, sorry, who've been sent to prison. Um, but otherwise black women. Right. And same thing, same thing here. So Unless they're the Marxist of balance. Yeah. Unless, unless they're the Marxist narrative, right? So we have James Baldwin um, highlighted in the book and other people who have that. Marcus Garvey. We can talk about Marcus. Yeah. The, the, people, about who the people who have that attitude of, I want mine. And it's well, so the people funny. Say, Go ahead. He believed the United States was a place that... Um, he believed the United States was a place that was worth saving from the horrors of racial injustice. Jamaican immigrant, et cetera, played a prominent role in back to, back to Africa movement. Right. So okay. Pan-Africanism, when I talk to Africans, they laugh. They're like, you know, if we live on this side of the river and you live on this side of the river, we hate you. So why do you think that if you send a bunch of people who are not born in Africa whether, so you have our skin, we're going to be like, what do you want? What are you going to steal from us? That's literally what I've been told by Africans who, you know, they're just like Pan-Africanism is a myth. So right. why are we treating these things like they're the only narrative? You have, you have James Baldwin, but you don't have Manning Johnson because they pretend that there weren't people of speaking the same thing at the same time or speaking a different narrative at the same time. Because once again, if you have the wrong narrative in this unifying culture, you don't get to speak. Manning Johnson wrote Color Communism and Common Sense. And he right. explained exactly how Blacks were used 
but that's not going to be in this book. Right. So I'm noticing in the comments, there's somebody who's very much against capitalism. And I just want to address this. Um, I would argue, J J I'm not going to say this right. So please forgive me. J J J J J my, Jira, my maybe? Jira. J okay. Um, I would argue that we haven't seen free market capitalism in America in this century. We haven't seen it in Europe. We haven't seen it really anywhere. We, what we're calling capitalism, what a lot of people are calling capitalism, isn't really capitalism. It's more of what you would call cronyism or even soft fascism. Um, because the government isn't owning the means of production like it would in communism or, or socialism. But it, is, it does have so many regulations that it's more like fascism in the sense that they sort of effectively own, especially the utilities and medical and so forth, because the re regulations are so stringent, you literally cannot operate without the government's you know rubber stamp. And they're constantly watching over you and you have to spend millions and millions of dollars on compliance with the regulations. That is much more aligned with what we would call fascism in terms of economic system. It is not capitalism. Um, and the same thing goes for, uh, you know, as far as most of our institutions, education is not free market at all. It's absolutely socialistic. Our medical uh, care system right now is sort of blended, but m leaning much more socialistic. So whenever I see people say, you know, oh, we're in common solidarity against capitalism, I really would encourage you to go look at what actual capitalism is or is supposed to be and recognize that going all the way back to the 1940s, Ayn Rand was complaining that we didn't have it anymore in the United States. And that's in the 1940s. And she was right um, because capitalism is voluntarism. Capitalism is where you have free, voluntary, mutual exchange. Government is not involved in the transaction at all. Once government enters into enters the chat, enters the transaction in any way, shape or form, it ceases to be capitalism. So that is not to say we don't have investors. We don't have sort of capitalistic things seeming to happen. It just is not capitalism. Capitalism is dead and buried. And what we now have is a blended economy of some cronyism, oligarchy slash fascism slash socialism, depending on the industry, depending on the the the. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, whatever you're talking about, but it is not actually capitalism. So your gripe when you want to unify against, believe it or not, is against the government. Because if you got the government out, you wouldn't have fascism. They wouldn't be regulating that and you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have cronyism because there'd be no reason for anybody, you know, with a lot of money to say, I'm going to pay for politicians. I'm going to buy myself some regulations to punish my my competition, there'd be no reason because the government wouldn't even have a say. And that would go away. Oligarchy would go away. All of these things would go away if we didn't have so much government force as it is. The more you bring in the government or the state to say, make it fair, make it fair, make it fair, the only people it's going to be fair for is the government and the very, very rich people who can afford to buy the government. And everybody else suffers. But that's not a complaint about capitalism. That's a complaint about people using force to dictate how an economy should function. So I had to clarify that because, you know, and, and I see here, um, I think this person said capitalism, according to the left, refers to private property ownership. Yes, I know. And they're wrong and they're wrong. And I would even argue that I don't own my property. I, it's an illusion that I own my home. Yeah. The bank owns my home. It's a very rare person who actually owns their home, like they've paid it off completely. And even if you did, even if I managed to pay off my mortgage tomorrow, the taxes that are levied on my property can go up at the will of the government. They could raise it to a point where I couldn't afford it. And even though I own the, the real property that sits here, I'd be kicked out because I can't afford the taxes. So do we really own anything? Same with my car, same with my bank account, same with my investments. After a point, because the government's involved, we don't really have truly private property. It's an illusion. So anyway, I'm sorry, I had to digress because we are talking about ethnic studies, which is decidedly anti-capitalist, but it's really sad to me because not only are the students are never going to learn what capitalism really is before they hate it, right? Uh, we are less likely to ever get it at all or have it back in any real capacity because they're so busy fighting it against a boogeyman, an illusion that isn't there and handing the government and the powerful, the elite, more and more and more power over them and giving up property rights, more and more property rights, right. more and more property rights. Well, and I, Sad. 
and from the view, viewpoint I have, which I did not have the knowledge that you had there, but what I do do is I speak to people who have come here escaping communism and right. they leave for a reason. They leave because they're promised all sorts of wonderful things. And sometimes they're even given them. Sometimes in the yeah. beginning, you know, they're they given their, their home and their little acre of land and whatever else. And then you have to remember this, that a government that is strong enough to give you everything you want is strong enough to take everything you have. And that I've heard over and over again from people who have escaped communism, which isn't in this book anywhere. No, they no, they don't talk about communism. The entire curriculum has been redwashed and you have people, you know, yes. whether it's Ralph Ellis, Ellison, James Baldwin or Toni Morrison, all of them flirted with communism. All of them had, you know, leanings in that direction because they were sort of bought into the same idea that that's what was going to save them. And the, and the sad irony is that there were these were still more nuanced thinkers right. than the people using them as examples. So, for example, James Baldwin would have been appalled at the decolonization of the curriculum. He would have been absolutely horrified at destruct classics where they're trying right. to get the classics out of the classroom because he felt very much like, you know, don't tell me what I can read and that what is white literature and what I'm, what's not accessible to me. I wouldn't want someone not reading my book because it's written by a black man. So when I mean, he said things like that, I'm paraphrasing. Yes. And so you have people who, even though they could be used in this curriculum as having grievances, first of all, they had more legitimate grievances because they lived at a time when there really was discrimination, but they would if if they came back today in a time machine and he said so james so we're doing the same thing oh really that's interesting yeah we're not letting them read shakespeare anymore wait wait stop what yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure he'd be like i never said that no no that's not okay and i feel uh, like that's the I, way of many many people many people yeah. if they understood what was actually happening they would go wait a second i don't i don't agree with that part of it yep so exactly um, Fred Hampton, you know, another one we're we're, the, the lack of balance is so noteworthy. I'm still waiting to see, I'm still waiting to see Martin Luther King. Right. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm <laughs> seeing like all these, I'm seeing these kind of people, more protests. Oh, there's Che Guevara, <laughs> you know, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting for like anybody at all who is, and there's so many examples, aren't there? There yeah. are so many examples throughout history of people of every conceivable ethnicity, minority, et cetera, who have triumphed, who have contributed, who have made America great, who, who made America the strongest country on the planet and the freest country on the planet, the kind of country where people from Eritrea and, and you know, Kenya and Mali and other places in Somalia, where they want to get away from where they are to get to. You now, why would they do that? If this place is so systemically racist and horrible, why would people be leaving Eritrea to come here? Right. It, it, they, it makes no sense. Because so they have an opportunity. They, so, right. so free college, Eritrea is an interesting one because I've actually interviewed someone from there. And free college means that the government chooses what you study. That's so right. People don't understand right. your, your, your body, your choice. Do you know what that means in China? It means that if you do have that second baby, or if you did now, now we're getting a little bit past that, but 20 years ago, if you did have that second baby and or wanted to, you were pregnant and you told them, no, I don't want to give up my baby. I don't want to have an abortion. They will cut your womb out. I know someone yep. who this happened to, they will cut your womb out so much for your body, your choice. You don't right. have choices when you give the government all the power and you say, oh, I'm against capitalism, but you're giving, you're giving the government all power. Do you think that That's they're right. benevolent? Do you believe that they love you? <laughs> like right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so then we have, um, this is the part where we're showing them how it's all oriented. I'm going to bring this up. It's all oriented to activism and grievance. Now, I think we've done a pretty good job of showing that already, but I think the last screens go, you know, a little farther. Um, this is some more stuff about the slave trade, but hang on. There's more about the activism. Here we go. This picture. You mean talk about grievance, pain. This picture is so filled with pain. Now, I'm not saying don't ever show students pictures like this. As with all curriculum materials, 
it's about framing. It's about balance. It's about the pr the predominance of painful, negative, struggle kind of imagery um, that conveys the impression that if you are not feeling pain or woe or suffering, then you're you're missing it. You have to first get like really angry and really upset. Um, and then, you know, here they have what strategies were used by activists. Did the civil rights movement accomplish its goals? Why or why not? So we're going to start getting into evaluating these students. Did they accomplish their goals? Do you think these students know? For real, do you think they really understand? They haven't been out in the world yet. Do, they certainly haven't experienced the pre-civil rights era. Right. And they've not really been taught about it for real. Right. So do you think they could make a, a, a fair judgment of whether it's accomplished its goals? Not from a book like this. I don't see how. Um, and then they, here we have affirmative action, Afrocentrism, bourgeoisie. Why are, why are we talking about bourgeoisie <laughs> if we're not teaching communism? Right. Militant and separatist. I mean, this is transparently Marxist. Right. Even if you're looking, look, oh, look, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and, da, 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 and it, the civil rights movement lost its spokesperson and figurehead. So future it would shift their focus to addressing issues, including blah, blah, blah. He gets like a mention in passing yeah. like, oh, and he was killed. And so then moving on. Yep. And there's one picture, but I will say there's there's no quote of his dream. No, I there's, think you're talking about this one. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. This, the six steps for nonviolent direct action. And it's right. so funny, weren't you taught that it was called, um, uh, what did they call it? Pa not passive, oh, it was like a peaceful. They do, they, they say that he took, he took some flack for being too passive. And that's pretty much the only thing that's in this book is that he took flack for being too passive. Um, right. You know, yeah, and you know, he's got they, they do go through information gathering, education, virtual, but they don't laud this as being effective, they don't talk about it as being a, a recommended method, even today. Uh, you know, it says nonviolence seeks friendship and understanding with the opponent, it challenges unjust acts, reconciliation requires that both parties, etc. This is all true, and yes. this is based on Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. It just gets like, a, you know, it's an also ran. In their, it's just in this what is what people about. expect. This is what people yes. expect when they hear ethnic studies. And to go back to like the Statue of Liberty picture, right? Um, yep. I wouldn't have a problem if we also had pictures of the successes. Yes, There's, There are so many stories of Black people who have succeeded that are not in this book. Because right. And what about that you can't be what you can't see? Yeah. What about where does that go? If you're going to talk about representation, right? Why would you not represent? So there's two kinds, right? There's the look, it's a black person, and there's look, it's the black brain surgeon, Ben Carson, yes. you know, or right. look, it's the it's it's the black uh you know mathematician who helped put men on the moon, right? Supreme right? Court justice. So, um, exa exactly. First Why are black we not actor to win an Academy Award? None of it's in here. They have Harriet that, Tubman, but that's another story that's scrubbed, right? Harriet Tubman was a person of faith that is scrubbed from the story because yep. it doesn't fit the narrative. Nope. And she was, I mean, like really profound faith. Yeah. Um, so then you have the, her contemporary resistance. We have some more climate justice. All of the images are like this. Yep. I could not find in all the pictures you sent me, I could not find one image of hope, one image where people didn't look sad or angry or depressed yep. or in pain or anything like that. It was all that way. Imagery in a textbook is very, very important. It's all put there with a purpose. So they, yes. they don't just randomly pick these pictures. Um, and they use their vocabulary, this you know, agency. Examining social movements is essential to ethnic studies as it reveals the agency of marginalized groups. What about people, individuals? Right. It, they constantly refer to people in groups. Yep. Agency, <laughs> only in a group. The hero is toil. Toil is unthinkable without, outside the collective. Environmental racism, mobilization, and solidarity. These are all collectivist terms. No, there's no room for the individual and even the individuals they put in the spotlight 
either all Marxists or they were all aligned with a group. Yes. Here's more. Yep. People's rights. We rise. These are all communist symbols. Here's more. This is, and, and even when you look at the timelines in this whole book, they leave out really important stuff. It's all the negative things. So this is, you know, what do you think? Why might removal from a homeland be significantly traumatic experience for indigenous peoples and for anyone? You mean like the 800,000 Jews that were kicked out of Arab countries in 1948? You think maybe that was traumatic? Oh, no, we're not allowed to talk about that. Speaking of Jews, um, any mention of them? I know there was like one page in one of those sections, but... There's, there's one page and all it talks about is anti American anti-Semitism. That's it. No mention of the Holocaust no. or anything? No. No? I think it might okay. say that they fled, but then <laughs> that's it. So, oh, you know, awesome. that's important terrific. Things oh, like look, we the resilient. Forced. Yeah, yeah. Im important things about the Jewish experience, like um, being forced to give up all of your guns before, you know, you were taken away. That's definitely uh -huh. not in there. <laughs> right. Or the seizing of property. Yeah. How definitely. about the like, well, actually, it started off with, you know, we got to collect everybody's guns. Then right. we're going to kick you out of your jobs. You can't teach at a university. You can't attend a university. You can't work. You can't work as a doctor in the hospital. You can't go to the hospital. You, I mean, these things happen like drip, 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 drip. And then, you know what? We're going to be needing your residence because we're going to war and we need this to be a headquarters. So get out of your house and we're moving you to live with your neighbors, you know, four families in one house. Yep. And then we're going to come along a week later and move you all into a ghetto on the other side of, you know, the country. Right. Um you know, this is this way do more protest, more protest, more protest. This is this is what this book is full of images, images like this. And notice, too, they're teenagers. They're roughly the age of the students. So they want, you know, you can't be what you can't see. <laughs> be this. Yeah. Be, we, this is what we want you to be. Um, and then we have this is, you know, film director counts by race and gender. So they get the kids really early on being, you know, pickers of nits. You know, how many white people, how many black people, how many this people, how many that people like it matters. Like it means anything. It often lessens the quality of the, of the film as well. Not to say that, that minorities can't make wonderful films, but when you are specifically looking for someone based solely on their... Right. On, on such, you know, arbitrary things, it doesn't really help. Yes. Exactly. And it also, we're not, I'm not seeing the, um, you know, NBA basketball player by count, but count by race and gender. Right. I'm not seeing, you know, so it's interesting how selective they are in their social justice too, about which industries or there's underrepresentation, which is like, what, what? No, that's fine. You mean they're like 90% black, but it's okay. Right. <laughs> Um, so it's just, it's just kind of interesting. There are other factors. So there it is again, the agency mobilization. So anyway, um, in solidarity what's happening with, the, yeah. in solidarity, what's happening with this curriculum? Where is it at? Like it's being sold to schools. Yeah. Now. Yeah. There, there, there are schools who are, who are, who are interested. It's the first one. So, um, because it's the first, first one, one on this publisher or the first one period the first one period so again let's go back this is utah nice conservative family-friendly utah is creating the first has created the first curriculum so when people think oh go ahead and move to a red state as long as you live in a red state you're going to be fine no red states are right. targeted it's right. targeted where it can get in, where people aren't aren't suspecting it. I mean, some people, I'm right. sure Seattle or Portland would be like, bring it on. This sounds wonderful. Here, people wouldn't right. be. And that's why they use the words. That's why it's that Trojan horse. Right. That's why it's ethnic studies. I've had so many people. I, oh, my gosh, Deb. I had somebody call me anti-Semitic the other day. And I'm like, I don't. There's literally no. Like, you do realize there's no <laughs> Jewish stuff in here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, not there. And that's, that Pretty was exactly sure the, argument. Wrote it. The, the argument is I don't want people to hear about the Holocaust. And I'm sitting there going, it's not in there. It's, it's not there. It's not there. 
black excellence um, is not there. Asian. Well, yeah. Yeah. It, the the thing is, and and again, with reference to all the comments that we're getting about capitalism, I, I like I said, I think it's to say that all of this is anti-capitalist is like saying water is wet. I mean, it's Marxist, it's communist, so duh, it's anti-capitalist because that's what communism right. is. It's literally anti-capitalism, but they it's more importantly than that. And I'm going to say more importantly than that, because if they wanted to kill capitalism, it's, it's on life support. There's really not much left in the West. So they want, what they want is perpetual revolution. When, if you get, go past Marx, because we're now in neo Marxism, we're, we're past actual Marxism. We're in neo Marxism where, you know, Frarian ideas, Marcusean ideas, these kind of people, you're talking, Hegelian, you're talking about, People who have no constructive desire whatsoever. Everything is destructive. Yes. They're nihilists as much. I mean, is it communism, but that's all because they're nihilists. Yes. And they, it, it is, I think, a form of mass psychosis. I think they hate because the good for being the good. They hate private property, which manifests in the f nuclear family, the gender binary, the, you know, whatever you want, using the environment for your own purposes, as opposed to like starving yourself to death because you want to save a tree, whatever it is, they're anti human life yes. and living and all of these things. Th those people who are religious would call it satanic. I mean, they would just say they're literally a death cult because they cannot envision for you. They cannot tell you what this fabulous future is that they're revol you know, revolutionizing towards. They just know what they don't want. So it's closer to Maoism. It's closer to, uh, you know, it's closer to the, the, the tr truly destructive movements um, that were spawned after Marx was dead and buried and in the ground. And, and people that's need to realize, what I see. Well, people need to realize that that Mao, Maoism is not like, oh, let's all kumbaya. No. It's millions of people killed. We are yes. teaching our children to other each other. Everybody yes. is in a hierarchy. And there's a part in the book where they quote that. And they say, you know, the people who are against us say that we have a hierarchy of oppression. You do. You absolutely right. do. Because you've got these people over here saying, we're the original indigenous people of this group so we deserve x and no we deserve this and we're all going to unite except for when the people that you don't like are gone then that mental then what are you gonna do what you've been taught is to look at the next group and define right. each group so it's until you're it's, it's completely left. destructive it relies on cognitive distortion yes. it relies on envy and hate um, I can't think of anything more damaging and especially implanted in a young mind that is still developing and growing and learning how to live in the world. You are pretty much destroying them. Yes. It is a form of, of uh, intentional, willful mental retardation because they'll never be able to actually um, conceptualize and integrate real knowledge facts, information to form a few, to build a future for themselves that is anything healthy or good. It's going to be constant struggle. And, you know, Sophie is asking wh why, who wants citizens to hate our nation? Well, it's an excellent question, Sophie. I think you'll get different answers depending upon, you know, which group of people I might look at. So for example, if you're talking about people in political power they don't want everyone to hate the nation. They just want the masses, so to speak, because if you can get everybody angry and riled up and, and hating each other and busy focusing on each other, what are they not doing? They're not paying attention to the people in power as they move all the levers of power around to maintain power in perpetuity and to basically steal from the people and you know render the people serfs uh, all over again. So we'll just have modern day serfs will basically be, you know, uh, labor stock to be plugged into some kind of, you know, uh, AI metrics of, you know, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. We being the elite at the tippy top, this has gone on for millennia. I mean, just go back in history. You can see cycles of the, the small elite at the tippy top who get a little cuckoo and they start to believe that they, they are there because they are truly better than everybody. And it doesn't take hundreds of them 
to decide they know best and the world would be a better place if only everybody did things our way. And so it's not that they want you to hate the world. They want to manipulate people so that they're more malleable and they use people. Lenin called them use useful idiots. Right. Um, then you have people, there's like circles. James Lindsay says there are circles, like an inner circle and an outer circle and then an outer, outer, you know, almost like a cult. And so th if you ask them, none of them want anyone to hate the country. They just want them to do certain things. How you feel about it, they don't care. Like if you could, if they could get everybody riled up and angry at each other and focusing on each other and fighting each other without hating America, they'd probably do it. It's just a lot easier to do and get people to hate America. They're also globalists. They also have no respect whatsoever for founding documents or they wouldn't be globalists. So they want global world government. They don't want America to be America. They don't want our constitution to give us the protections that we have. And so how do you do that? How do you get people to stop wanting to own their own firearms? How do you get people to stop d desperately wanting to maintain their free speech and all the things that are guaranteed in the Bill of Rights? Well, get them to believe that America is a terrible place. And that would be a really quick way to do it. We don't want freedom of speech because people say mean things. Take it away, please. But just from those people, they don't know that this is going to come for them next. So it's it's very, very sad. But I don't think there's an easy answer. I think there's um, also China, though, right? I mean, there's um, yes. China and it's, it's hand in our education. It's kind of yes. scary how much yes. the CCP has to do with our education at, at, yep. at Harvard. And yep. remember, there are people there are people. At the, in the upper echelons of our society who actually think China has, has it right. Who genuinely believe that our freedoms are bad, are bad for us, mm -hmm. that we don't deserve them, need them, should, we shouldn't want them. They look at most people in America as rabble. Mm -hmm. they, they, it's, it's almost like, you know, we left, we've, we left an aristocracy and said we're going to build the anti-aristocratic nation. And then set about trying to rebuild the newest aristocracy almost as soon as we got here. It began very quickly, very, very there was maybe this much time where people were comfortable with it being sort of a flat society. And we did have, after World War II, we had a nice big middle class that, that existed, that was real. And it included black people too, by the way, uh, and pe Asian people and you know Jewish people and all kinds of people that it really had a lovely flat society. But what was also on the rise, right, Carib was communism right and the marxists the communists the soviets said at the same time we're never going to topple the united states we're never going to best them if we can't interfere with their cultural reproduction right so where do we go to do that we've got to go in the schools and they infiltrated the universities and they infiltrated our k-12 system demoralized the living daylights out of us and, and i mean that literally demoralized yes. us yes. and we began throwing it away by family, by nuclear, by husband and wife, two parent household, by, you know, all the things became throwaway. Let's normalize everything being meh. Right. Yep. By faith. So here we are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Opiate of the masses, whatever. And I'm not a, I'm not a religious person, but yeah. let's face it. Our country had, that was its sort of grounding philosophy initially. And we didn't exactly replace it with anything else. It's not like uh, the United States of America got so enlightened that we could just, you know, do without faith because we had a wonderful, you know, Aristotelian set of values that you could be an atheist and still be enlightened. OK, no, it got replaced with Marxism as a new religion where the state is your God. And that's not better. <laughs> it's just not better. Um, I'll say that and I'm, I'm right. not a believer. So there you have it. Um, anyway, I, I'm really grateful that you came and did this today. I hope we were able to cover what you wanted to cover. Is there anything else that you want to say that we didn't cover? Um, it was a lot, like there's a yeah. lot in that book. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's so much in the book. I just, I really want parents to understand that the most important thing that you could do right now. Um, and I'm sorry if it upsets people, but I think pull your kids out while you still can. Pull, yes. pull, pull them out of school while you still can, because we are turning our kids. We're going through a cultural revolution. Mao did this, Stalin did this, and yes, Hitler did this. They started with the kids. They started with educating them. My friend, if I can plug this, my friend Julie Bailing just um, 
she's written um, a book and also there's a movie coming out, a documentary coming out called Beneath Sheep's Clothing. And it explains how this infiltrated. It started with the churches, with liberation theology, and that's what's happening. So that's what right. that's what happened for the blacks is that liberation theology came into the churches. That's Obama's pastor. Changed their that focus. is Obama's pastor. Exactly. And and that's who's running our country right now. I'm not saying Obama's running our country. I'm saying liberation theology has gotten into our schools as well. And yeah. in my opinion, it is ugly. I don't understand hating someone, hating anyone based on something that they can't choose. But that's, that's right. absolutely. And and even if we've done the worst, absolutely worst things in history, which we haven't, because go look at some other countries and look what they're still doing. That's right. But there's still, there's gotta be grace and we lose right. grace. Now, I am a person of faith. And, it, and if we lose grace, you don't have to be my faith to have it. But if, if you that's lose right. it, then you have no hope. So, that's right. Deb, I really appreciate it, you having me. <laughs> no, I'm so glad you came and everything you said, I, I agree with. Um, I think uh, people ask me all the time, like, what, what should I do? What should I do? And I agree with you, you know, to pull your kids out while you can, because that may not always be possible and may quickly become a situation of if you're kids are in and you try to get them out, you're going to have to jump through a bunch of like, you know, uh, mental health wellness checks to prove that you're okay. Whereas if you already have your kids out, it's harder, it's harder to yank them back in than to keep them where they are. Um, right. But I would also say I've, I've become a big fan of a concept called escape forward. Uh, there's an Academy of Ideas video I've been sharing around. And it basically says that, you know, when, when, when society has gone a little bit crazy, you know, you can, you can, get all sad and depressed about it, or you can look for ways to live free on your own, in your own life. So, you know, center your energy around your own family, your own children, your own spouse, if you have one or, you know, loved ones, friends, and just focus your energy on making that the best it can be and trying to insulate your, your life from these institutions, from these forces. So, you know, this wouldn't be a time to take on a lot of debt. <laughs> this wouldn't be a great time. You no, know, this is a better time to like sell things and buy something less that you can actually own and doesn't need to connect you to the government as much or has a very small connection to the government. Stay healthy. If you need to lose weight, lose weight. If you need to you sleep better, eat better, take your vitamins. And I, I mean, for real, like take care of yourself, take care of your family, uh, learn a skill, learn to grow food, learn to do things. This will be fun too, by the way. It's quite <laughs> enriching to learn to be, you know, to have autonomy. Um, but take back your freedoms on a small scale and you'll feel a lot better and you will be less, uh, you know, down, down looking at all the stuff. Like, you know, Carib and I look at this stuff all day, every day, <laughs> and we would be, we would want to just crawl into the bottom of a bottle probably if we didn't have a strategy, you know, you have faith, mine is philosophy and, you know, being productive, like trying yeah. to think of ways that I can, be productive. You notice I got out my sewing machine. You know, I'm I'm trying to do things that are like, you know what? I yeah, I, they can't tell me what to do. Um, there's a there's a, a show. Well, it's not a show. It's a series of movies. I keep talking about it because I'm such a Tom Selleck fan. <laughs> but um, it's Jesse Stone. There were these books, and he he took on the character. He's a, he's a small town police chief. And his boss keeps saying to him every time they want to bully him into something, you know, I could fire you. You know, I could fire you. And he just calmly says, mm hmm, you can, but you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. And that, you know, go read Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Go, right. go read what he wrote because that become ungovernable. And it, not, it doesn't mean you have to be a protester. Just right. be the kind of person who's like, if I, if it, they can't tell me what to do unless I let them. Right. So in every aspect of your life that you can just do what you want to do, do it. What I always do say it. is, is not in my home, not in my community, not in my schools. And so if you figure it out, if you figure yes. enough that you're not afraid anymore, because knowledge is power, even if you have to dig in yes. and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. You still have yes. that knowledge, right? So you have knowledge. And then once you have that knowledge, go share it. I teach 15 year olds. Well, I, I teach teenagers and I teach them, I teach them about Marx and I teach them 
about like I've I ask them Socratic questions and I say things like, how can you be less wrong about something? Let's take any topic because what we want to do is create people who aren't afraid to hear different points of views That's and right. to be the reasonable people. Because eventually, I do believe eventually, and I don't know when that me means, unfortunately, but eventually they're going to lose. They're going to eat their tails, right? Yeah. And so it they're going to, it all comes back around. Yeah. And that's what it gives me. Outside. That's what gives me hope. Is like none of this lasts forever. We see, we've seen through history, truth yep. will out, good will out in the end. I truly believe that if yeah. I'm not around to see it, so be it. I still take comfort in the knowledge that it will. Yes. And I just obviously try to do what I can to keep my kids and your kids and people I know and care about from having to suffer in between. So that's yeah. always my advice. It's not exactly actionable immediately, but I think if you start thinking about it, you can do stuff um, about it and then, you know, keep educating yourself. Knowledge is good. Knowing about this is good. You certainly don't want to be caught unaware. That's why we cover it. I don't cover it to go, oh my God, be afraid. I, <laughs> right. I, I, cover it. I cover it because I never want a good person to have the wool pulled over their eyes and, and be like, you know, take people at their word and go in good faith and then have, you know, be lied to. Right. So like, here's what it really means. And now you decide what you want to do. Um, that's all. That's it. I'm, I'm an educator. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who joined us today. Uh, once again, please like, share, and subscribe. If you are not yet a member of my community over at Woke Screen, it's wokescreen.com forward slash the reason we learn. I do two uh, members only shows there a week. Plus you can communicate with me and get access to homeschooling resources and other kind of enrichment resources, plus discounts, t-shirts, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're having our big sale now. There's Today is 20% off of upgrades on membership. So take check it out and hope to see you there. Carib, I hope you have a wonderful evening and <laughs> I will see you again soon. Sounds great. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye.